Ladies and gentlemen, it is time to try something new with office hours. Not all the time, just for this one particular office hours. I am going to do an office hours speed round. And so, it's annoying, right? I kind of like that about it. It's like... <laughs> so I'm going to try to do as many questions as I can, as quickly as I can, because I notice that some of the questions in the queue are just really easy to answer. They don't require in-depth conversations or discussions. So let's go do it. So the first one up inside here is from Mike. Mike says, Brent, the delete job is blocking for around 20 minutes on an update or insert calls from our API. It's expected to complete within a few seconds. How can we avoid it? Well, first, you only do deletes after hours or during maintenance windows types things. Second, go search for Brent Ozar Delete Faster. And I've got a blog post on how you use a top technique with a CTE called Fast Order Deletes that does exactly what it says on the tin. Next up, we have Philip asks, Philip says, hi, Brant. Really, Brant? They're all good questions, Brant. Do you have any information about the newly released SQL Server version? Anyone who knows can't say, therefore anyone who is saying can't know. So that kind of explains why you're not hearing any words from people. Anybody who actually does know has signed a non-disclosure agreement. So anybody who's telling you anything doesn't know what they're talking about or they're violating their NDA, one of the two. Next up, Mike asks, we have an ETL job that tries to change table names, loads uh, ta data into a temp table called table 1x. Once it's completed, we do a little switcheroo with different table names. As the prod table is connected to multiple jobs, we can't acquire locks, which is needed to rename cause blocking. How do I avoid it? You write your ETL jobs better. You can't play the old switcheroo game. That's not how ETL is supposed to work. Instead, thinking about trickle loading your stuff. Load only the things that changed instead of using the Groundhog Day ETL pattern where you're constantly reloading the same data again and again. Next up, Jose asks, how do you debug stored procedures with Azure SQL database? The same way that I do on-premises, I use uh, dumping things into a temp table and then answer, repeating them back out at the end of the stored procedure, or I use print statements. I teach you how to do that in my mastering query tuning class, but let's be honest, you probably don't need to watch that whole thing in order to learn how to debug with a print statement. Gustav asks, Hi Brent, have you ever worked with Apache, Apache Kafka to move data around? No, uh, because I don't do data moves. That's just not what you hire me for. I'm a performance tuning expert rather than a moving the data around expert. So I wouldn't even know, begin to know how to judge that kind of thing. Next up, Jacksonville John says, Hi Brent, what are some good use cases for the new Last Writer Wins replication feature in 2019? Can we now have tables synced across different geographic locations? Yes. Uh, would that be better than an always on availability group for a disaster recovery site? No, because you have to set up that replication for every single table. And as you add new tables, you'd have to change replication and set that up each time. That would be a big ginormous pain in the keister. What this is for is really for people who have application servers across multiple continents and they want to be, I'm not saying in continent, that's what your application is, but application servers across multiple continents. And then they need to be able to work even when one can't continent and can't talk to the other continent with a fairly fixed number of tables that they're not adding tables in like crazy, like willy nilly. Uh, next up, uh, Farouk says, uh, are, is there support for first responder kit stored procedures in Azure SQL? Farouk, there's a thing called readme.txt. And as you might have guessed, I guess you didn't guess by the name, you were supposed to read it. And inside there, there's something called documentation. And in there, it tells you what it's supported on and what it isn't supported on. It's not supported on Azure SQL DB. It may have hit or miss results for some of the stored procedures, but you'll learn more about that as you read the fine documentation. And then finally, the last easy question for the speed round. Uh, Vengeful Flamingo, love the name, says, Hi Brent, what's your experience with delayed durability and how would you approach deciding to enable it? What you want to ask is, am I uh, bottlenecked by write log weights? 
And can I not fix that in the code? Like if I got an ETL process that's loading one individual row at a time, and the weights to get that into the transaction log are big enough that they're holding up the entire process. And am I willing to walk away from data loss? Delayed durability will lose data even on a graceful shutdown. Read the documentation on it. Microsoft does not flush the, uh, the uh, transaction log to disk even on a graceful shutdown or a SQL Server failover. So you can run into issues where data was lost and you won't know what data it was. This isn't a big deal for a lot of ETL projects where if the server fails over in the middle of a data load, they're just going to restart the data load anyway. So that is our first speed round session. So hopefully you enjoyed that. I will shut up and get out of the way now and let you go on with your web surfing. Adios. <laughs>